All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to lecture guide number seven, which is on the Renaissance in northern Italy and in particular painting in northern Italy, uh, primarily in the areas around Venice. And so let's start off by just pointing out that there are a few kind of fundamental differences between the types of paintings that you find in northern Italy um, in the early 1500s, so early 1600s, and those that you saw last week when looking at the work of the High Renaissance. The, the big kind of fundamental difference between these paintings is that the area of northern Italy is not so close to Rome. It, it's, it's closer to the northern end of Europe. Uh, and so um, the work that we'll be looking at is not quite as closely associated with Neoplatonic aesthetic philosophy uh, as we saw in the art of southern Italy during the same time period. As a matter of fact, one of the biggest differences between this art and the art of the kind of typical Italian Renaissance Quattrocento works and High Renaissance works is that the art of Nord Northern Italy is much more interested in sensuality rather than rationality. Remember I said before that, for instance, Michelangelo's David is a work of art that while being incredibly beautiful, is not meant to inspire sensual thoughts. Uh, the senses in Southern Italy, as we saw in Neoplatonic philosophy, are not quite to be trusted, right? The higher form of all art should be art that appeals to the mind rather than the body or the senses. Um, now, that's not quite the case up here in the north, uh, partially because many of the painters that you'll see came out of Venice. Venice has always been an area of Italy very closely associated with sensual pleasures. Um, the most notable of these is perhaps that Venice was a kind of uh, almost tourist destination for people who are interested in um, seeing beautiful women. Often these women were courtesans. Venice uh, was an area that had huge, beautiful festivals. And even today, of course, I think people think of Venice as an area that is um, very, very closely associated with romantic thoughts and so forth. Um, the other big reason, though, is that all of the works that you're going to be looking at, with a few very notable exceptions, but the major traditions of the North, are not arts that were produced primarily for churches. As I said before, you'll see a couple of these that absolutely are. But these are works uh, that are created for these middle class patrons who want beautiful works of art to fill their homes. Uh, and because they're not so closely associated with these major centers in southern Italy, they don't feel um, a need to represent works according to those Neoplatonic standards of the day. Um, so we'll keep our eye on those types of things. Now, what goes along with works that are central is not just a different subject matter. As you see here on the screen in front of you, we'll get to this work in a bit. It's a nude woman lying on a bed. I think we can all understand why that might be understood as sensual. It's also the way that these subjects are painted. Um, in Venice, which again, closer to the Northern Renaissance world, that we talked about, it's not right next to, but those traditions of Flanders certainly filter down here. Um, these, these painters were the first in Italy to adopt oil painting. Uh, and the way that they build up paintings is through a series of what are known as glazes. You lay down a really bold, uh, you know, background color. Oftentimes in these northern paintings, it's it's red, and then you paint over the top of that with thin layers of oil painting to build up your form. And the light actually penetrates through all these forms and kind of glows against that brick red background and gives them a kind of warm luminosity. But the the bigger thing is that when you build up paintings that way, instead of thinking of kind of drawing a line and filling in that line, which is the premise of a lot of Southern Italian paintings, you get paintings that look, and, and you won't be able to tell this so well in these slides, but they look like uh, uh, an image that is shot with a soft focus camera lens. They have kind of hazy uh, outlines to them. They don't have that sharp delineated line form that you get in the works of Southern Italy. 
And remember how I said that in Southern Italy, line or disegno was associated with the rational mind, like a kind of ordering system to all things. Um, color, and, and that's what they called this type of painting, building up layers of glazes. They called it colorist or painterly. That was understood to appeal to the senses. So it's the very technique that they use that also appeals to the senses. This is also a, a shorter lecture than last week, and we will be dealing with a new subject um, that becomes very popular during this time period in Northern Italy, and then will uh, spread, um, which is the subject of the female reclining nude. And you've got a special topic reading on this this week, uh, and I will be picking up some of the ideas of that as we go along in today's rent, uh, lecture. Let's start with this work. There are going to be a number of works that aren't in your textbook from this lecture, but I, I think it's a good idea to kind of expand what you're getting in your textbook to give you a greater sense of everything that's out there. This is a work by a Northern Italian painter whose name was Giulio Romano. And this work is usually referred to as the fall of the giants. Now, Giulio Romano um, did a number of things. This is a, a mural painting. It's not actually painting on wet plaster, but dry wall, uh, including architecture uh, and other things. But in this case, what occurred is that, and this is very common, um, both in south, southern Italy as well as northern Italy, um, is that a very rich middle class patron, you know, this this mercantile class and bankers and so forth, had a basically a pleasure home. And he wanted that home decorated with um, with paintings, not just paintings that you hang on the wall, but actually full wall paintings in order to delight his visitors, in order to impress them. And what he asked Giulio Romano to do here is paint a scene that comes out of Greek mythology. Some of you may know this, the Greek Olympian gods, the gods like Zeus and Poseidon and Hades and Aphrodite and Hera and Athena and so forth, they come after an original group of Greek gods known as the giants or the titans, and they actually overpower the giants or the titans and, and take over Mount Olympus from them. And that's what you're witnessing here. It's a scene in all of the walls as well as the ceiling are filled with these paintings in which you see this kind of fun struggle between the giants and the Olympian gods for supremacy uh, over Mount Olympus, which is the abode of the Greek gods uh, in this Greek mythological story. It doesn't really have a big moral message. It's not Christian uh, in its kind of illusions. It's just meant to be something where you would walk into the room and be uh, amazed at the incredible trompe l'oeil, fool the eye uh, painting. Remember, fool the eye is hyper illusionistic paintings. And, you know, originally you're looking at this scene, those those fences that you see uh, against the wall to keep people from touching the walls wouldn't have been there. So it would have appeared and even the doors were painted. It would have appeared as if you were in the midst of this scene unfolding. So I'll get you up close here on a couple of these. It's really cool up in northern Italy. So you see uh, here up above, there are clouds where the Olympian gods are looking down and columns falling and crashing to the ground and uh, giants, the titans, uh, witnessing their demise here. Again, just kind of a fun painting that would have uh, made people marvel at its illusionistic qualities and and basically was just painted so that so that people could be amazed by you know the painter's work as well as the patron who bought this work or commissioned this work to be created. Um, this is a little bit more of a close up. You can see you know the forms are fair almost cartoon like. They look to me very much like, you know, Maury Sendak's work in Where the Wild Things Are. Um, I've always wondered whether he looked at this work. It's this kind of playful, uh, you know, hyper illusionistic painting that this is just one example of many of these things that were being painted in northern Italy as well as throughout southern Italy uh, at this time period.
Moving forward to another artist, this is one of the religious works of art, uh, and and what I'm trying to draw you into here as well is the the start of a a, a number of um, techniques that were derived during the early 1500s and really get going during the late 1500s into the 1600s during the Baroque period. Um, and what I mean by this is hyper illusionistic often ceiling frescoes, uh, frescoes that are on the ceiling above you. And that's what this is. Um, unlike Michelangelo's work, which on the Sistine Chapel ceiling, which is painted as if you're looking at something that could very well be hanging on a wall, right? Its orientation is just, you know, something that you would see across from you on the wall that has then been transferred to the ceiling, kind of tipped up and put on the ceiling. Um, this work by Correggio, known as the Assumption of the Virgin, which is painted in the dome space of Parma Cathedral. So again, uh, further up north here, you see a scene in which the perspective is one that takes the standpoint of you looking up to the sky and witnessing a scene unfolding above you. So it's a totally different type of perspective than one that would be on the wall. This is as if you're looking at the dome and the dome has been dissolved into a kind of swirling vortex of clouds, all kind of pushing towards the center, very, very illuminated, bright scene of heaven uh, with angels all around it and saints in this scene and so forth, that is about the subject of the Virgin Mary's death, or rather, um, not quite her death, the Assumption of the Virgin is an idea that came out of Catholicism again that isn't really found in the Bible, but the Virgin Mary was so important to Catholics, right? She's so important in this story as a, a mediating figure. She's both a mediator between God and earth in that she's this pure vessel that allows Christ to come to earth, but she's also a mediator in the sense that she provides this kind of maternalistic figure within the Catholic faith um, and Christianity at large, where you can kind of beg your forgiveness of the maternal nurturing mother um, rather than, let's say, going straight to God and saying, hey, can you forgive me? Here's this, this a little bit more sympathetic character for Christians. In any case, she became so popular that an, a theory or theological kind of position developed in which people started to argue that right at the moment of the virgin's birth, or death, right when she's going to die, uh, God um, couldn't bear to actually have her die and go through what was known as the mortification of flesh. And so right at that moment of her death, instead of allowing her to die, he drew her directly up into heaven. And this is called the assumption. And that's what you're witnessing here. The assumption of the virgin at this moment of her death, she has been kind of pulled up into the cloud space. Uh, taken directly into heaven in the swirling vortex of form. All of this, if you follow my cursor, are the uh, groin vaults that actually hold up um, the dome itself. It's a, a little bit more difficult than a groin vaulting system, but I'm not going to make you remember the, the terms for this. However, within this, all of this is painted. It's all painted in trompe l'oeil. This is also part of the dome space. These are real windows in this space, these little round things you see around, but everything in between this has all been painted. Let me get you in a little bit closer on this so you can see some of this. So uh, getting us in close into this dome space, as I was saying before up here, these are real windows, but everything around it has been painted to look as if you're looking up to the sky and witnessing this. And this figure that's kind of being sucked into the vortex of heaven with all of these angels and saints witnessing it is the Virgin Mary herself. Correggio was also famous for painting scenes that are very erotic, um, very, very sensual scenes. And remember that in the South in particular, sensuality and in Christianity in general is something that's a little bit questionable, especially the sensual representation of women. But that doesn't mean they didn't do it all of the time. They just had to figure out kind of 
rationales or cover stories for how you could do these things. Um, this is a work by Correggio called Jupiter and Io. Comes from Greek mythology again, and this work was actually painted um, as a series of fresco paintings in, um, in a building that was uh, created and commissioned by Federico de Gonzaga. The Gonzaga family, which many of us know about, they become part of the Jesuit order. We have Gonzaga University here in Eastern Washington, for instance, uh, was one of the very, very powerful um, Italian middle-class families that worked uh, out of the North. Uh, in this case, Federico Gonzaga was, um, well, there's no easy way to put it. He was, he was incredibly egotistical and narcissistic and all kinds of, uh, thought of himself as uh, almost a god. He actually, at various stages of his life, thought that his, um, his relatives descended from Zeus in some way. He was also, though, uh, a really well-known philanderer, a ladies' man, uh, as he would have called it, and, uh, you know, thought of his conquests of various beautiful women in society uh, as being very, very much like Zeus's conquest in Greek mythology. For those of you who don't know, um, Zeus, the king god of Greek mythology, uh, is constantly on the lookout for beautiful young women. He's constantly hiding himself from his wife so that he can consummate these relationships with these beautiful women. We saw a little bit of this when we looked at that copy of Leonardo's Leda and the Swan last week. Um, and, and think of it this way, Federico Gonzaga actually commissioned Correggio and other painters to paint all of the loves of the god Zeus and thought of himself as being like Zeus. Now, there's there's no real cover story for this. There's no real rationale for this that he could use to explain to other people like why the sensuality is okay. But in this case, that was all right because these were very private paintings. Um, they weren't open to the public. Um, they were only open to his closest friends and to his own um, interest, to his own kind of uh, delight. So what you're witnessing here is a scene in which Zeus seduces the, the young maiden Io. Um, you don't see Zeus here very well because in this story, Zeus um, disguises himself as a cloud so that his wife Hera won't see him and so that, you know, in all of his majesty, he won't overwhelm Io. Uh, and he is embracing her uh, with his big kind of you know, paw like cloud hand, and you may be able to barely see it. There's a face here in the cloud that is kissing Io here. Now, what we're literally witnessing is a, uh, you know, a woman in, a, you know, erotic ecstasy. She is being embraced. She's, you know, uh, being given pleasure, and he is showing this. This is nothing that you would get away with in the South. It's certainly not something that Botticelli was interested in, in his Venuses. In those Venuses, they're all supposed to be about beauty with a capital B that is supposed to appeal to the mind. And these are very much about the sensual, erotic aspects of beauty, uh, right? So the subject's very erotic. It's not set up in a perfect kind of pyramidal form. It's not emphasizing line. It doesn't have a, any of those trappings of Neoplatonism. What it has instead, and this close-up shows you quite well, is this kind of soft form built up out of layers of glazes and the soft form of the cloud. And it's lots of touching and lots of eroticism. And that's what you get more of up in the north. In the south, this would have been a really, really questionable types of work, right? You would never find this in a church, for instance, even in the north. These are private works of art about erotic, basically male heterosexual fantasies. One of the other really cool things you get in the north, and this is the, the work of Giorgione called The Tempest, and it may have been um, completed by his pupil, the much more famous and long-lived artist Titian. Um, there's still some question about that. But one of the things you get up north as well are paintings like this that are really mysterious. It's hard to tell what the subject matter really is. Is it a biblical story? Is it some kind of poetic allusion to something? No one knows. No one's been able to kind of figure this out um, completely. 
And one of the reasons for this, again, is that these were works of art that were created for private patrons and didn't need to be understandable by the public. Only the artist and the patron talking together and working out their ideas really had to understand the works. And so today, not knowing uh, what they intended, it's tough to figure these things out. Um, I always loved this work when I was um, younger. It's the tempest just means an incoming storm here. Um, the word is the work is kind of moody and has this quality of some kind of foreboding to it. It's very mysterious, right? We have on the left a woman um, who's partially clothed, suckling a child, and then off to the I'm sorry, off to the right, off to the left, you see a man with a uh, a spear. Uh, over his shoulder, looking over at her. So the, the question has always been, is this a representation of some Greek mythology? And no one's been able to figure out what that would be. Is it perhaps a biblical story? And one of the interpretations is that the woman you see over there is actually Eve, who was suckling her first child, Cain. Um, she is nude and uh, very closely associated with nature, which is a very common thing in the uh, history of art to associate women with nature and men with culture or men with the outside public world, like we saw in the Jan van Eyck work, the Arnolfini double portrait, for instance. It's no, uh, no real reason why she should be nude here, though, except to think of her as nurturing, as like... Um, as like the earth, uh, a form of fertility and nurturance. And if that's the story, if this is supposed to be Eve, then this must be Adam, uh, who is her protector, kind of looking over at her, um, you know, wondering about his fall from grace and so forth. But we'll never know. This one might appear to be very odd as well. This is a work that was almost certainly started by Giorgione, but finished by his pupil Titian. It's usually known as Fête Champêtre, or pastoral concert here. And, uh, you know, again, at first glance, it's just frankly kind of weird, right? We've got a couple of guys sitting in the center. Um, one is playing a guitar, and the other one seems to be listening to him. Uh, then on the left, you have a woman who is nude playing a flute, and uh, I'm sorry, on the right, you have a woman playing flute, and on the left, you have a woman who is standing next to a cistern, a, uh, a well, and dipping a glass in there to pull out beautiful pure water. And then you see some shepherds in the background and some kind of house off in the distance. So then the question becomes, you know, what the hell is this all about? Uh, why are these women nude and the guys are fully clothed and playing music? Is this some kind of weird, you know, um, get together of these men and these women? Are they seducing them with music and so forth? Um, and the answer is probably not. Um, probably what we're looking at here is a kind of allegory of art. In this case, the art of music. And that allegory um, of music making is associated with these nude figures who are meant to be understood almost assuredly as muses. Now, a muse is, uh, you know, comes from Greek mythology and Greek myth, depending on uh, what, what time period and what author you're looking at, there can be as many as 13 different muses for different things, history and poetry and painting and, and so forth, philosophy even. Uh, however, in Western art uh, of this time period, muses just simply become inspiration for creativity, and they're almost always pictured as women, most of the time nude women. Now, what is the idea behind this? Why are they nude women? Well, this has been a, a, an old idea, and it'll keep coming back um, in this lecture today. Uh, the idea is that... Um, you know, men, and it's always presumed that this is, you know, a heterosexual world, um, that men are inspired by women's beauty, uh, especially kind of their erotic attraction to women, right? Um, however, in art making, the idea was that a woman might inspire a man through her beauty or for his longing for her, but then the artist or the musician in this case doesn't try to hook up with the woman. What he does is he re-channels that erotic desire for that woman 
into the creation of art or music or whatever it might be. This process is called sublimation. Sublimation is the idea that you take something that is base or lower, or as the Italians would have called it, vulgar, and you refashion that into something that is higher in its kind of societal acceptance, or in this case, uh, in you take something that is base, like erotic energy, and you rechannel that energy into the creation of higher forms of art or music or poetry. So the process of sublimation is one in which something that is base or lower level is transformed through creativity into a higher form. And that's probably what this allegory is. You can see that these guys um, seem really interested in each other and aren't noticing the women at all. And that may be because they don't even witness the women. The women are just an idea. They are the inspiration that leads to the creation that we get to see here uh, as witnesses, but that they don't see in the actual scene. You can also see that the man uh, in the red, uh, in the center, who is set up in a pyramidal form again, right? Not everything goes away in the north, um, is dressed much more nicely. These are, you know, uh, fancy clothes than the man who is uh, to the right here, who is dressed like a shepherd. He may be one of these shepherds that's come up to learn from the, uh, the um, richer noble or uh, middle class man here. Um, that's important because on the side of the man with, uh, you know, less expensive clothing, probably of the kind of shepherd class, you see this woman here who is almost completely covered up. She's turned away from us and the cloth kind of covers her genital area, playing a flute or a recorder. That flute, uh, any instrument that you blow into, like a horn or a flute, is understood as more bass and um, flutes and so forth. In fact, music in general, musical instruments and art are very often symbols of, of sexual activity. They go back to a famous Greek myth um, about Pan and Syrinx. Uh, Pan was this satyr. He was half man, half goat. He's always trying to hunt down the nymphs of the wood and have sex with them. He's chasing this, this nymph, Syrinx, who calls out to her father to save her from Pan, and her father saves her by turning her into reeds, um, growing plants, reeds at the uh, edge of a river. And then Pan, uh, not to be denied, cuts some of those reeds down and fashions them into his pan flute, that reeded flute that has multiple different uh, kind of openings to it. And from that point forward, you know, that symbol gets adopted that a blown instrument is a, a more vulgar allusion to, or a baser allusion to sexual activity. And of course, it's associated with the more base man here. He's of the peasant class. On the side of the uh, the more rich guy here, who's actually playing the music and one presumes kind of explaining the process of creativity and the beauty of art to this other man, we see the woman who is facing us. You know, you can see her genital area, although as we'll learn, they never picture female genitalia. That would be too vulgar for them. Lots of penises in the history of Western art, very few vulvas in the history of Western art, too vulgar to show that. Um, and this woman is associated with higher forms of beauty. Um, she is dipping her clear glass into clear water, which are symbols of purification. In other words, what we have here, and I brought this up when we were talking about Botticelli, is a Venus vulgaris, earthly love and erotic activity. And we've got a Venus celestis off to the left. The celestial Venus or Venus that's all about beauty or creativity or sublimated eroticism. And again, the whole thing is painted in this soft kind of hazy form to play up the idea of sensuality. More by George Oning again, probably finished by uh, Titian. Um, George Oning died young. That's why many of his works were finished by his pupil. Um, this one's called The Sleeping Venus, and it may be the first of the major reclining nudes in the history of Western art. And I just show you this in brief to, to kind of point something out 
that will become, uh, you know, uh, more um, richly developed in the next work we look at by Titian. Um, first of all, um, the, let's start with this idea. The nude itself starts with the male nude, of course, and we know what the male nude means. It's the uh, embodiment of perfect beauty that brings us closer to God. The female nude has the same rationale to it originally with things like Botticelli's work, right? That's about female beauty with a capital B. Beauty is uh, accompanied by truth and goodness. When you're looking at it, you're brought into approximation with God. However, this is a little bit different, right? Um, this is a figure who's lying on her back um, with her eyes closed, um, you know, no clothes on, um, you know, allowing us to look at her. During a time period where, of course, nudity is not something you saw anywhere but in art. And what I've always said here is that if the rationale or the kind of reason that this was allowable in a very, very kind of strict uh, button down culture of, you know, Christian values is that the female nude was okay because it represented beauty. We're kind of stretching that rationale a little bit here. It's more like um, I want to picture a beautiful woman and I like the pleasure of looking at beautiful women. You know, it's erotic pleasure. Uh, and I need a rationale or a justification for that. So what if I just called her Venus? You know, if I call her Venus instead of sleeping hot nude, that in a way helps justify why this is art and not just erotica. Because, you know, there's nothing in this that really tells us this is Venus other than the title. And it's not even clear that when he painted this, he called it Venus. And even if it were Venus, just stick with me a bit here. What makes this make sense? Like, OK, Venus is on her way to her friend's house. You know, here's the building in the background. Um, but she suddenly along the way gets very tired and can't make it. So she decides to go take a nap, but it's very hot outside. So she takes off all her clothes and lays down. It's like, yeah, it's not very convincing. In other words, you know, there's no real rational justification for this other than that kind of cover story, in which this is the new. The other thing, though, that I want to point out about this is that it is setting us up as viewers in a really powerful position. That position is what is called the position of the voyeur. And a voyeur, of course, is someone who gets to look without being seen in return. Um, you know, peeping through a peephole or more kind of commonly, if you've ever had binoculars out and look at someone who's far away, you can see them, but you know, they can't see you in return to the same degree. And it feels powerful to have that, uh, that kind of viewing dynamic, as it's called. And here in front of these nudes over and over again, they set up a situation in which we are the voyeur looking at someone who doesn't look at us in return. It gives us that kind of pleasure in looking. <laughs> the work I want to spend the most time with, though, for this class is this work by Titian. Titian is probably the most famous of the Northern Renaissance painters of this time. I'm sorry, Northern Italian Renaissance painters of this time. Uh, he has a long career and he's most famous for all of the nudes that he did. He started off as a pupil for Joe uh, under Giorgione, and then, you know, continued on after Giorgione died. This work is uh, called The Venus of Urbino because it was a Venus painting uh, created for the Duke of Urbino, um, and it is uh, filled with symbolism and all kinds of um, eroticism. So let's kind of work our way through this slowly. Let's start with this, right? When these works were painted, it wouldn't have been okay to just say, hey, I wanna paint a really hot woman lying on a bed, giving me a come hither look, right? And that's what this is at some level. Um, you would have to have some justification for it. So the original justification seems to have been, it's about beauty, right? In the same way that the male nude is about beauty, so is the female nude. And then you just kind of stretch this out. And instead of being a Venus on a half shell, you put her in a bed, uh, you know, looking out at you and you justify it still by saying, hey, it's a Venus. 
or at the very worst, it is eroticism that has been sublimated into a high form of art. Right. That's that's why you can show these on the walls and people don't call you a creepy, uh, you know, guy during this Christian era. However, with that being said, there's a lot more going on here that deserves some explanation. And, and one of the first things to talk about, this comes up in your reading, is a distinction that was always made between the nude and the naked, right? And um, I'm going to have you kind of struggle with this in the reading a little bit, but I will put it this way. When John Berger in your reading says there's a, and he's actually taking these ideas from Kenneth Clark, who is the original kind of uh, coiner of these terms, but he says there's a difference between the nude and naked. What he's trying to say is that the nude is a form of art or it's a kind of, uh, you know, nakedness that is accepted or understood as a form of art rather than just being erotic. It's almost like, as he calls it, a form of clothing. So what he means by this is uh, that all of the cover stories, all of the kind of conceptual lenses that would have been brought in front of this work to understand it make us think of this as art rather than just eroticism. But the other thing he wants to point out about the nude, and this is key, is that the nude objectifies women. What does he mean by objectification? I think most people have heard this before, the male gaze, um, I feel objectified, men objectify women, and so forth. What Berger wants to argue is that when you look at these pictures of nudes, you don't think of a real person who is, you know, in that painting. You think of those figures as being there for you, the presumed heterosexual male viewer. Let me go through this again. You are presumed to be, in this situation, her ideal lover. She looks back out at you with this kind of, you know, very, very accepting, come hither look. This makes you feel powerful. Um, you don't think as a viewer, hey, who is she? What are her thoughts? What does she want? You know, what are her desires? That does never enter into the equation because she is clearly set up to be there for you. Now, what do I mean by that even further? Well, number one, since it's a painting, she's never going to, it doesn't matter who you are, how grotesque you might look, you know, in general life, you step up in front of this painting, she's always going to give you that look. She's not going to say, not you. But more than that, this body, which at its time period would have been the ideal sensual body, it may not be your type, but at its time, this is the ideal body, is a body that's been carefully constructed so as to show off all of the things that were seen as very sexually erotic at the time. Don't have to take off your clothes, but try to attain this pose lying on a bed. Look what's happening here. Both of her shoulders seem to be back on the, the pillow to some degree. We've got one breast full frontal, one in profile so that you get both kind of shapes of the breast. You get this thing going on. The hand, like the Venus Pudica that, you know, modestly shields herself. Also, you follow that arm and you keep looking there. You, you're not a pervert. This is a technique artists use to point you in that direction. Uh, and it's doubled down on by the edge of this curtain, and you follow that implied line, and it moves you right there as well. And notice what that hand's doing. It doesn't look like that hand's really so much covering. It's not even clear that perhaps she's not touching herself or something like that. So it's all set up to make it appear that she, you know, just wants you. You are the guy for her, and you don't have to take into account any of her feelings. And that's what Berger wants to call the nude, something that is uh, covered by the clothing of, uh, you know, the, the classical ideas about nudity, uh, a kind of lens through which we see these works of art that's quite different than nakedness for him. Nakedness is the best example I've ever come up with is when you walk in on someone without their clothes and they don't know and you don't know that you're going to actually have this encounter, almost immediately both of you are embarrassed or both of you feel like someone needs to say, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, right? You never feel like you're going to say you're sorry in front of these paintings because you don't think of these paintings as having real people in them with their real feelings. 
Nakedness, however, is thinking of people or even painted figures as having their own feelings or own desires that you have to take into account. And that will stop you from objectifying them. If you think of the figure in a painting as having its own feelings, you're not going to feel like that figure is just there for you. And thus the objectification or turning it something into an object of your desire doesn't occur to the same degree. Now, if you're wondering, there are no hard and fast rules for this, right? So if you're feeling like someone has feelings in that painting and you're taking that into account, then you might be understanding that figure as being naked rather than nude. But I think for the most part, we know the differences, right? They come across pretty clearly. So that's one of the things that Berger wants to argue. The other thing, though, that he wants to argue before I get into all the specifics of this painting has to do with this phrase where he says, men act, women appear. And this is something that, again, I want you to struggle through, but think of it this way. When we look at David's nudity, David's nudity says to us that he is perfect, he, he is ideal, he's going to go out there and slay Goliath. That's all an indicator of his godliness. Men act, they are judged for their actions, they are admired and esteemed for what they do in the world, whereas women, more often than not, are admired and esteemed for how beautiful they are, for what can be done to them potentially for what kind of pleasure they can give other people, right? The other part of this, though, is what is usually called self-surveillance. And there's no good way for me to explain this other than to say, if you have time and the inclination, I would ask all of you to do a little viewing technique that I do in my classes, which is take a friend and for two minutes, just look at them directly in their eyes, right? Try not to say anything while you're doing this, just look at them in their eyes. And what you'll notice is that you will start trying to see yourself or understand yourself through what you presume that other person is seeing, right? That's what we call self-surveillance or seeing ourselves through the eyes of others. It happens all the time, for instance, when um, you feel really self-conscious and you start wondering how other people are seeing you. And what Berger wants to argue is that because there's a higher priority placed on how women look, self-surveillance happens more often for women in which they look at themselves through the eyes of presumably men and judge themselves and their appearance according to how men see them. And these works of art, so goes the argument, do that as well. When a man, a heterosexual man, looks at this work, he thinks of her as his ideal lover. When a woman looks at this work, at least a heterosexual woman, what she does is identifies with the woman in the picture. She wants to be like her in her appeal, in her allure, in her beauty. It's one of the reasons that fashion magazines have pictures on them of beautiful, beautiful women and sell to women. Women are looking at these figures as models. They want to be like that. They're looking at these works through a process of self-surveillance and basically fashioning themselves in relation to the expectations of the society around them that says, more often than not, you should be even more beautiful. You should be even more attractive. You should be even more sexy and so forth. So that's a kind of entry into that. There'll be other questions that I'll let you uh, get to on your own. So now let's go to how is this work, the Venus of Urbino, understood during its time period? Well, what we do know about this work is that Titian oftentimes used Venetian courtesans as his models. And many, including your text, will argue that what you're looking at is a Venetian courtesan lying on a bed being seductive. Now, I don't buy that argument at all. Uh, many, many artists use prostitutes as their models because those were the only women who would be willing to be painted in the nude in a very, very Christian society. The question is not who the model was. The question is, who was that model supposed to represent? Now, what we know about this as well is that the Duke of Urbino, who commissioned this work, had just recently married a much, much younger woman. I think he's in his mid-60s, and he married a 10-year-old. 
This 10 year old, however, they, they would have married and she wouldn't, they wouldn't have consummated the marriage until she was 14, which was the, the age she was when this painting was finally delivered to the Duke of Urbino. So many people have noted that there are, there are symbols in this work that have to do with marriage. And I'll get to those in a minute. And that this work is somehow attached to the marriage between the Duke of Urbino and his young wife. Okay, so that's really common. That happens all the time. We saw that in a way in Botticelli's Primavera, right? The allegory of springtime, marriage pictures that are fairly erotic um, being there. And that makes perfect sense to us. But there's a particular class of paintings that are known as Liebesbilder or love pictures. And that's what this seems most likely to have been. A love picture would have been a representation, not of your wife, not even of her face, but a representation of Venus, the goddess of love and the goddess of fertility and marriage that would have been painted and hung in the marital chamber, the bed chamber. And the idea was this was not only erotic, but would also help produce healthy, beautiful children um, for the couple. Uh, I know it's hard to believe that this, you know, that people really believe this, and it's not even clear that they did, or whether this was just a way that husbands uh, put erotic pictures on the walls um, in their bedchamber to heighten the you know, sexual uh, encounter with their wives. It's, it's not clear, but we do know that this class of paintings known as love pictures did exist. And there are plenty of indications that this is associated with marriage. In the background, these chests, and there, there's a painting from the front of one of these chests, not this particular chest, but these types of chests at the Seattle Art Museum. These chests are what are known as cassone. Cassone usually were given in pairs to uh, married couples. So there's an indication of marriage. Up in the window, this is a myrtle plant, and myrtle plants are symbols of marriage and fertility and the goddess Venus. These two are servants back here, so we know that this probably isn't a courtesan, but a rich uh, woman, or even Venus, who is having her clothes probably put away here. Another symbol of marriage is the dog over here. Dog is a symbol of fidelity, uh, and just like her, he's kind of soft and compliant and loyal to whoever steps up in front of this. And then finally, the symbol of the blossoms over here of roses, which are symbols of fertility um, and, and, and fecundity, right? So these are all symbols of, uh, of the idea of marriage. And as I said before, one of the strongest interpretations of this work, the kind of cover story, the thing that allowed one to represent a beautiful woman lying on a bed almost completely nude, giving you a come hither look, was that this was meant to be a love picture, to hang on the wall, to increase sexual desire, but also to help promote the creation of beautiful children. Remember, beautiful children also means not only healthy, but in the image of God. There's that look, right? Um, a look of compliance. It's a look of, you know, kind of come hither. It's not a look that questions you at all. So even though she doesn't have her eyes closed, there's no kind of, when you stand in front of this, you don't feel judged. You don't think about what is she thinking about me like you would if you were looking at another person. You think more, oh, she likes me, right? Um, I want to show you another representation of this idea of sacred and profane love. This is a Titian work on the subject. Uh, again, these are justifications for the representation of female nudity, which is always questionable, even going back to Greek times. Um, male nudity was indications of God, but female nudity always had to have a kind of stronger cover story to it. And this was one of the big ones. Um, these were oftentimes given as marriage pictures as well. Um, the uh, sacred and profane love here, the sacred love is the one that doesn't have her clothes on. That's the Venus Celestis. And she doesn't have to have her clothes on um, because she is a representation of beauty without any sexuality, um, supposedly, uh, in that situation at all. The figure on the left with her clothes on uh, is the symbol of the Venus Vulgaris. 
earthly uh, love. And you can actually see in the background here a couple of rabbits off to the side, uh, symbols of sex, right? Um, which is associated with her and the blossoms in her hand. On, on Venus, the sacred Venus side of Venus uh, Celestis, there are knights jousting, which is probably supposed to be a symbol of fighting your erotic urges. And then as, um, you know, as this special topic reading by John Berger on the ways of seeing and the tradition of the female nude um, goes on to point out, there's something pretty problematic of the representation of female nudity because, um, you know, it's very, very erotic and it is clearly set up as a male fantasy that objectifies women. What Berger is not saying is that nudity per se is bad or that any kind of eroticism in painting would be bad, right? Eroticism, I always think, is just a part of human life. We're we're, you know, pretty smart animals, but we are driven by our erotic um, desires oftentimes. I think everyone knows this. Um, but in a very straight-laced Christian society where it wasn't appropriate to just paint fantasies of your desires, and it is a man's world, so they're mainly male fantasies, you had to come up with all these weird cover stories to get the nude erotic female figure into the picture. And this is a case in point. This is a work that's called uh, Dene, um, usually called Dene in the Shower of Gold. It's a Greek myth. Um, the Greek myth is that um, Dene was, I, I love this story, by the way. The Greek myth is that Dene, when she's born, her parents, who are a king and queen, take her to the Delphic Oracle. And oracles foretell, you know, what this child's life is going to be like and give you any kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, foreshadowing so bad things to come or good things to come and every king and queen always takes their their child to see these oracles and it almost always goes all wrong which by the way if you're a parent don't take your kid to see an astrologist um, because these are the kinds of um, reports that they got in this case the delphic oracle tells Dene's parents when she's a young child that she's going to grow up and her uh, her children are going to kill the king. And um, the king says, well, that's super bad news, uh, but he can't bear to kill his young daughter. So what he does is he locks her in a high tower with no doors and only windows open to the sky so that no one can enter and she can't be impregnated. And yes, if you're thinking of the story of Rapunzel, as I said before, we rip off all of our fairy tales from the Greeks, of course. So Dene is locked in this tower. She grows into a beautiful young woman. And of course, the, the king wasn't thinking about something that anyone who read enough Greek mythology certainly should have. And that's that uh, with windows open to the sky uh, and with this woman blossoming into a beautiful young woman, who was likely to see her? Zeus, and Zeus does. He sees her, he seduces her, he um, whispers sweet nothings in her ear, and then he shows up through this window as a shower of gold light. Uh, that's his disguise for this time, and impregnates her. And later on, of course, her child grows up to, to kill the king. In any case, that's what you're kind of witnessing here, although the shower of gold light has become a shower of gold coins for some reason. We don't really know why. And Dene is just lying here on the bed, again, awaiting her lover, Zeus, um, with a little puppy next to her again, that faithful dog. Um, and, and again, this is a way that the artist can show an erotic figure without getting in trouble for it. This is high art. This is a Greek story. I'm just representing that. And it becomes fairly uh, justifiable in the history of art. Berger also points out these types of pictures and, and many others. Um, this is Venus with a mirror. Uh, Venus with a mirror is a very common subject, or Venus at her toilet, or uh, Venus uh, you know, with her reflection, or just women with mirrors. These pictures are what are known as vanitas pictures, for the term uh, Latin term of vanity. But they don't just mean being vain and caught up in one's own looks. Vanitas pictures are pictures that are saying something like this. Don't get too caught up in your own material pursuits or your own 
material looks because you got to keep your eye on the most important thing, which is your spiritual salvation. And so showing a woman with a mirror in her hand is really something that is meant to have a moral component to it. Ladies, don't get too caught up in your beauty because you have to be thinking about your spiritual beauty as well. Now, as your reading points out about these pictures and what you see here is Venus in the center um, covered with these, and it's all painted in that, that, that colorist or painterly style, uh, covered with gorgeous, very touchy-feely um, velvets and furs, um, you know, gorgeous jewels in her hair. She's being crowned by a puti over here. Cupid is holding the mirror for her over here. Um, what, what your reading points out about this is that these things are kind of weird because on the one hand, they're showing you, uh, you know, uh, a very, very beautiful woman. And on the other hand, they're saying, don't get too caught up in beauty, right? They're what we call in art history a devil to devil artic articulation. They say two things at once that basically mutually support each other, even though they're contradictory. Let me try to explain this to you. On the one hand, it says, don't pay too much attention to your beauty. And that then justifies the other thing it says, which is, look at how damn beautiful this picture is. After all, people aren't buying these paintings because they need to be reminded not to spend too much time, um, you know, in their, material pursuits or uh, making themselves even more beautiful. Men are buying these pictures because they are beautiful. So the fact that they have a moralizing lesson to them that says something like, don't get too caught up in its beauty, actually justifies the representation of the very beauty or the very erotic kind of uh, aspect of these works that it supposedly condemns. And we call that a devil articulation. I wanted to point out as well, briefly, um, one of the major patrons for the arts and a major patron for Titian was a woman by the name of Isabella d'Esta. Uh, the Esta family was the major family out of Mantua, and Isabella d'Esta married a, an older uh, member of this family and then went on to inherit massive amounts of wealth and to dispense that wealth to artists. Right. So she's a really important and many women were patron to the arts. But as a woman, she is a product of her age as well. And so when Titian is called to paint her in this portrait, what he does and probably at her bequest is paint her according to what is most esteemed of women at this time period. She's incredibly wealthy, right? All of the clothing she's wearing, that incredible hat with all the jewels in it and so forth, that's all a symbol of her wealth. That's standard. Both men and women can show off their wealth. But the things that are more in line with what women are esteemed for than men are that, number two, everything she's wearing is of the latest fashion, right? So she's very fashionable. And number three, that she is, she's been painted as if she were 20 years younger than she was at the age that she sat for this portrait. Why? Because even today, of course, youth is associated with beauty. And for women, the most kind of important thing you could be is beautiful. So she has represented herself as 20 years younger than she actually was when she had this painted. This is just another way of saying that men are oftentimes in a portrait, they will accompany themselves with all kinds of things that tell you who they are and what they've accomplished in the world. Whereas women more often than not in their portraits are represented being even more beautiful than they originally were because the higher priority is placed on women's appearance and the acts that men can achieve. Just briefly, I wanted to show you a couple of Titian's um, religious works to end off today. Um, this is the so-called Pizarro Madonna. It was commissioned by the Pizarro family to, uh, it's a very big work. It's on canvas, by the way. 
Um, in Venice, by the way, I should have said this, there's not very many fresco paintings um, because it's so moist up in Venice that the, the plaster just peels off the wall. So they started painting on canvas. Most of the works you've seen before are paintings on boards, but canvas is able to kind of fluctuate with the changes in the humidity. Uh, and so this is where we get the development of canvas painting. Um, in any case, this was painted for a church um, and it was in a private chapel for the Pizarro family. You see the Pizarro family all kind of lined up at the bottom here. This is Jacobo Pizarro and then the rest of his family over on this side. It was actually painted to commemorate Jacobo's death. And then up above it, we see um, St. Peter uh, and he's checking in his book of good and bad deeds as Jacobo Pizarro, after dying, is going basically into heaven. And then we see up above this, uh, the Madonna and the child who are um, inviting Jacobo into heaven. And this is Job over here. You don't need to remember him and another um, famous uh, monk uh, behind him over here. So in a way, um, this is kind of a typical memorial picture, not so dissimilar than the Sistine Madonna that we saw of Raphael. Uh, in which you have all the patrons in the foreground of the family, and you have a kind of, uh, you know, entry of this man into heaven. But what's a little bit different about this is that, again, if we've just come out of that work by Titian that showed you the Isabella d'Est uh, and what she is esteemed for, when Jacobo wants to be remembered, he wants to be remembered for what he's achieved. And Jacobo was actually the... Um, the commander, the admiral for the papal fleet. And so what he's done here is it is accompanying himself with his flag that shows his coat of arms on the flag. But above that is the papal tiara, that kind of crown that the Pope wears to show that he worked for the papacy. And then behind him, you see a turbaned man. This is to show that he has conquered what Christians at this time called the infidels, uh, Muslim cultures. Uh, so he wants to show you his accomplishments. The other thing I wanted to point out about this is the style is a little bit different than what you see in the South, isn't it? The composition is set up with a pyramidal form. If you go through the head of Jacobo, he looks up at Peter, go up to the Virgin Mary, and then Christ looks down at Job, and you go down his arm to these figures. You can see a pyramid there, but it's a pyramid that's kind of asymmetrical, isn't it? And then we see something else as well. We see a kind of balancing of these asymmetries, something that is at a diagonal over here and columns that shoot off above the frame into kind of wherever, into infinity. So things are getting a little bit what we call di more dynamic. They look more in movement uh, in the north than you would see them in the south. The final work for today's lecture is another religious work, which I'm showing you as it exists uh, in its cathedral in front of the altarpiece, or I'm sorry, behind the altarpiece here. This is a work called The Assumption of the Virgin by Titian, another religious work by him. The figures in it are basically life size. And I'll just go over this briefly. I said before that the Virgin Mary provides a kind of mediating figure between heaven and earth. Um, it's uh, kind of like if your family is anything like mine, you know, if I accidentally threw a baseball through a window or something, I didn't immediately go tell my dad, oh my God, I'm sorry, I threw a baseball through the window. I would go to mom and be like, hey mom, I'm, I, I blew it, I accidentally threw a baseball through the window. Uh, do you mind kind of bringing this up with dad for me? She's kind of like that figure. And here we see her being assumed again. So at the moment of her death, instead of dying, she's taken directly into heaven. She's in the center here, right? Um, and then God's up above waiting to uh, greet her and bring her into heaven with all these souls up above and that glowing nimbus. You can see that down below, there is a negative space that's roughly in the same pyramidal shape as the Virgin Mary's compositional body right? That's where she's just left from, to be drawn up by all these angels in the clouds into heaven. It's almost like those old mosh pits where if someone falls down, everyone else falls down on top of them. You see a lot of kind of frantic energy down here. And then here in this zone, you see everything getting calmer. And then up in heaven above with this dome shape, things getting calmer still.
that Neoplatonic idea here, even in the north. Right down below, kind of a collapse and chaotic frenzy, and up in heaven, everything sedate. All right, well, I hope you had fun this week. Um, some time with that reading. Uh, for this week's reflection essay, you're going to be answering questions from the reading guide about that, uh, as well as uh, thinking your way uh, further along uh, his arguments. And I'll see you next week.